Welcome to Digital Asset News, take a top stories in cryptocurrency digital assets and break them down to bite-sized pieces. Today, pretty interesting stuff. First up, is Ethereum and DeFi still far-fetched or is Ethereum really a viable option for DeFi and all the requirements it needs? And should we be looking to a different project to make decentralized finance an actual scalable solution? Also, Bitcoin price may surge as fear and uncertainty strain global markets, but is there that much fear and uncertainty out there? We're going to take a real deep Deep dive into that question, which could lead us to the answer of where is Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, and the entire digital asset market going? Now, to lead us into question of the day, we're going to go over what you could possibly do if you get hacked for 3.5 Bitcoin. And we'll go over that last, but first, let's take a look at what's going on in the market. So, today it is uh, Monday, September 28th. So, what do we got? Sunday was not a great day. Monday's looking a little bit better. Bitcoin almost to the 11,000 magic mark. I like to see that. Maybe a uh, 10 9 today, up 1.6% for 24 hours. I will take those numbers. Ethereum blasting past the 350, up to 364, 3.4% up. Fantastic. Tether's tether. Nobody cares. XRP, 24 cents. Watch out. Bitcoin Cash up to 2.6%, 2.32, nice. Polkadot making a massive run, 7.8% for a 24-hour period. I'd like to see that. And Chainlink finally above $10 as it uh, dipped massively from its all-time high of around 18, and now it's at 10.66. Hopefully, uh, we can see how far it can go. Maybe it's got a little bit more room to run. We'll find out. Binance Coin up, up, everything's up. Pretty big green day, except for Monero, 2.6. Don't understand why that would be, but uh, there it is. 2.9 down for NEO. Nice down, NEO. Don't do it anymore. 6% for Cosmos and their interoperability. VeChain up 6%. I'd like to see that. IOTA, 7.8. Uh, who knows what's going to happen with IOTA? I don't know. Ethereum Classic, after their 51% attacks, no big deal. 3.1%. <laughs> Synthetics uh, and then oh OMG Network 31% and OMG had this nice little uh, rally because it was helping out Ethereum with a network and trying to um, deal with all the different gas fees so that's a reason for what's going on but I like to see that definitely uh, basic attention token up six percent Doge coin for you Doge holders 0.5 Digibyte, and I never talk about Digibyte, and I'll apologize now. It's a good project, could do some good things. I don't own any, uh, but uh, maybe that could change. And Celsius Network almost breaking that dollar mark. Um, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, Celsius is on a quite a tear, and uh, I think they're up, I mean, massively for the entire year 23% for seven days. And uh, I see great things in the horizon. So we'll see how that works out. But uh, let's jump in the, in the day's top stories. huh? So first up is Ethereum DeFi still far-fetched. And this really kind of lays out the scenario for what could happen if uh, we can't use Ethereum for decentralized finance and what needs to be done to uh, hit the criteria of what actually could make this sustainable. So what is this all about? So DeFi is the latest buzzword. Yes, we've heard nothing but uh, DeFi for the last month to two months. Everything from uh, synthetics to sushi to yam to whatever you you name it, it's been there. I don't think it's I don't think it's right where it needs to be, but I see a massive potential. It just all depends on where is it going to be built and who's going to take over. Anyhow, the need for scrutiny into existing systems and Ethereum DeFi is top of the list. Martin Froehler, a mathematician, recently told Amiya that there is no doubt that Ethereum DeFi is simply the best platform. Now, this is just one opinion uh, from Martin, but you got to understand that there are many opinions out there, and we're going to kind of go over everything that we can to see what's the best option. Anyhow, he states that DeFi is a global decentralized platform for money and any new kind of application. And Ethereum DeFi is on the world's second largest crypto platform to capitalize on the market after Bitcoin. And that is true. I mean, it's great to have, you know, a, a massive market cap, a massive network. But the problem with the um, just the the colossal nature of, of Ethereum is that there are problems, there are bugs, there are slowdowns, there are gas fees, which are astronomical that they need, really need to address. And if they can't address those things, uh, it cannot work, period. So this is the sentiment on the flip side of that. And it states not all experts are in favor. Froler, who happens to be the founder of the Mar4 platform. So first of all, I was like, what the heck is that? I've never heard of that. So what's Mar4? So I did a search and it came up nothing. So I had to take a look at uh, the LinkedIn profile for Froler here, Martin Froler. And it says, gives the about features. And then the founder of Morpher, M-O-R-P-H-E-R, not 
the other spelling. So then of course you go over here and Morpher is a crypto stocks and Forex exchange. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, I'm not gonna go through it, but that's exactly what it is. So this is the CEO talking about an exchange. So maybe a little biased, just saying. So it says DeFi projects are reaching Ethereum, but experts say that the network is not yet able to at its best and its current capabilities are just not up to the standard. It's designed as such that everyone needs either to communicate with it, but they all have issues. The biggest hurdle in adopting on a large scale as would be the incapability to handle more than 15 transactions in a second and its block time is more than 15 seconds. So that's a big problem. Uh, when you're talking about, I mean, it's okay right now and it's it's even taxed right now as, as the limited amount that it is, but Let's say we start to get all small businesses in and let's say we start to get all types of people in, all types of retail, all types of institutional investors. They all want to use DeFi. What would happen? It would collapse. There's no way that at its current state that this could actually be sustainable. It just cannot happen. So what do we need to do? Well, let's go on. Ethereum is a great decentralized platform and Ethereum DeFi is a reality in the making. And that's what's going on right now with ETH 2.0. If you haven't heard, ETH 2.0 is going to be rolled out in phases and it's going to take about two years. And the first one's going to come up in November, uh, potentially even sooner. But there's really what it comes down to is three phases. Phase zero, phase one, phase two. Phase zero is right around the corner. And phase zero is the name given to the launch of the Beacon Chain. Beacon Chain will manage the Casper Proof of Stake pro protocol for itself and all of the sharded change. So this is where we're going to get to staking. This is where that magic number of 32 Ethereum is going to get to, where you're going to be able to stake that Ethereum, uh, gain some extra tokens or gain some extra Ethereum or gas by what you stake in this type of format. And we're going to go from proof of work to proof of stake. And this is why it is so important. That is just phase zero. And that's just coming up right now they've already gone off of the test nets everything went pretty well so it looks like they're going to move forward now that only solves one issue proof of work to proof of stake the other issue is the transactions and that won't be done until phase one and we're looking at another year six months to a year i think another year correct me if i'm wrong put it in the comment section but phase one will be shard chains shard chains the key to future scalability as they allow parallel transactions throughout and there will be 64 of them deployed in phase one over time. And then moving down, phase two is just a point in time where the functionality of the entire system will start to come together. Shard trains transition from simple data, compare containers to a structured chain state and smart contracts will be reintroduced. So again, you're looking at a quite a timeline, uh, looking at over two years, and uh, hopefully it all works out. But the question really has to be asked is, what if it doesn't? So here's the problem right now, what they're trying to fix. Gas prices continue to rise, which is why Ethereum is not able to improve its performance even though there is a dire need in bringing new users to leave the network because of the situation. CEO of uh, Dex One Inch, Serge Kuntz, stated that Ethereum does not have the capacity to host DeFi. It's not so easy that everyone everything gets fixed all of a sudden. Everything takes time. Obviously, we just talked about it. It's going to take at least two years. Lastly, Monir Benjamin, I'm sure I nailed that name, CEO of Paraswap, expressed that considering Ethereum DeFi, we should also consider how Layer 2 is unable to solve the user and problems and provide them a friendly environment. The biggest disadvantage would be that users have to worry about not being able to pay the funds immediately to the users, which we're talking about as far as layer two. And layer two, one of the most famous layer twos is the Lightning Network for Bitcoin, which is anybody using that? I don't think so. I mean, hey, Jack Dorsey from uh, Twitter is pushing it, but uh, I haven't seen too much on it. Lastly, it states he believes that where some products may find Ethereum DeFi a suitable option on Ethereum 2.0, it may not be true for all DeFi projects. So here's the problem, or here's my final thoughts. Someone's going to solve this problem. Someone's going to solve this problem. It just takes a person way smarter than me and way smarter than a, than, than, than a group collective. But it's going to happen. The reason why it's going to happen is because there's too much money at stake. There's too many things to fix. There's too much upside potential for someone or some group to not come out of the woodwork and go, this is how we're going to solve it. Now, that may be Ethereum. That may be some other place. That may be layer two, like Matic. What's Matic? Matic Network brings massive scale to Ethereum using an adaptive version of Plasma with proof of stake based side chain. So uh, all the people who hold Matic, congratulations. I'm sure you're gonna make uh, you know good investment there, but I don't know if that's actually the case either. Could it be other forms? Could it be a Cardano? Could it be other some of the cryptocurrency project? I don't know, but all I can tell you is this. I don't know where it's gonna come from, but I'm hedging my bet. And that's why I have a 
large plethora of baskets of different cryptocurrencies because Ethereum, if I had to put my money on it, someone had to put a gun to my head, I would probably say, yeah, Ethereum's gonna solve it. They got a lot of smart people. They got a lot of leadership. Uh, they have a great community and they are gung-ho, ready to do it. However, it's gonna take a long time. Is there somebody else in the work? Could be, don't know what it is, but uh, I try to hedge my bets as best as possible. But at its current state, it cannot work. It needs upgrades. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Let's move on. Next up, Bitcoin price may surge as fear and uncertainty strains global markets. And we have nothing but uncertainty uh, lately for 2020. What a, what a bummer of a year, huh? Anyhow, from a technical standpoint, a quick, a quick look at the CBOE volatility index shows that the implied volatility of the S&P 500 during the aforementioned time window increased dramatically, rising above the $30 mark, which means that there could be a big crash coming. Who know? It bears mentioning that the $30 mark serves as an upper threshold for the occurrence of world shocking events, one of those being the coronavirus in March. Otherwise, during periods of regular market activity, the indicator stays around $20. So $20, I think it's pretty good. $30, that's uh, wars, terrorist attacks, and of course, coronavirus and all the different problems that come along with that. However, when looking at gold, the precious metal lately has also sunk heavily, hitting a two-month low while silver saw its most significant price drop in nine years. And I was listening to this. It was a YouTube uh, interview, and it was it was within the last two days. And Robert Kiyosaki, which we all know, the rich dad, poor dad, and he's been touting the benefits of gold and, and of course, Bitcoin. He basically said, hey, gold and Bitcoin are instruments of uncertainty. Uh, so when things don't return to uh, a some type of normalcy, uh, the price drops. And uh, right now, he says that there's not, he it was weird. He's like, well, the uncertainty isn't as bad as I thought it would be. And I'm like, really? Every, everywhere I looked, there's nothing but uncertainty. But um, I mean, hey, everybody's going to tell their opinion. Anyhow, for me, uncertainty, I mean, it's not great, but it does fuel the cryptocurrency digital asset market. With the highest level of uncertainty, that's when you see the prices surge. And that's exactly what we've been seeing. Moving on. Speaking of Europe, the continent as a whole is currently facing a potential economic crisis with many countries dealing with the imminent threat of a heavy re recession due to the uncertain market conditions because of the coronavirus. And it's not just Europe. It's everywhere. Nobody is 100% certain right now, like, you know what, this is going to be our best year ever coming up. Unless you're Purell, <laughs> who, who makes hand sanitizer. They're probably going to have a fantastic year. But if you look from, I mean, the presidential election coming up in the next 40 days, uh, quantitative easing, who knows that's going to happen? Who knows there's going to be a stimulus package? Who knows if these small businesses are ever going to come back? Looks like 20% to up to 40% may not come back at all. And uh, I mean, just everywhere, it's just been hit massively. So when you talk about uncertainty, I think this is the most uncertain times that I've been in outside of 2008 when the financial crisis hit. Moving down, Joel Edgerton, CEO of crypto exchange Bitflyer, states this, the price movement is mainly driven by institutional business with retail customers continuing to buy the dips and accumulate assets. A key point to watch is the possible effect of the U.S. election and the changes the Fed's response from its current very accommodative stance to a more normal stance. And if you're not familiar, if you're, not, if you're outside the United States, we're going to have another presidential election. That'll be interesting. And it's going to happen in the next 40 days. And right now, the Federal Reserve is pretty much buying up assets, buying up liabilities. And we all know about the quantitative easing. But if they shift from that position, it's kind of like pulling out the security blanket underneath from everybody. And they're like, oh, now we got to do our own thing. We can't just rely on the Fed just to print money out of thin air and just bail us out. Well, that sucks, but that's what has to happen. So again, if we're going to talk about uncertainty, this is the time. Lastly, he thought that uh, any changes to the U.S. tax code could also have a direct effect on the crypto market, especially as various states, as well as the federal government, continue to be on the lookout for newer tax avenues to make up for the stimulus packages that were doled by the Fed earlier this year. And this is what I've been talking about in this channel for many a time is that you cannot print money out of thin air and not have some kind of backup or pay for that price moving on in the future. So whether that be us or our kids or our grandkids, somebody's paying that price. And the easiest way to get out of that or actually get some revenue is to raise taxes. So I think that's exactly what they're going to do. And I'm going to tell you why. So just on a little side note, this is from the Wall Street Journal. The IRS sets a trap for crypto tax cheats, which is a pretty good title actually um 
So I'm not going to read it. Here's what's going on. So it goes like this. This is the new 1040 form, and this is on the very front of every single person's taxes. Now, this is going to ask the question, in any time during 2020, did you receive, sell, sell, exchange, or otherwise acquire any financial interest in any virtual currency? Not cryptocurrency, not digital assets, virtual currency. So I don't know if you got any kind of like a virtual currency in World of Warcraft or something. I have no idea, but that's a very broad question. And this, they put this on the very front page because they wanted everybody to see it. And this is right next to your first name, last name, and address and everything else. So you're not getting away from this question. Whereas opposed to, it was actually buried, not really buried, but it was in, in another part of the form that you actually filled out at the 1040 SR, which, which was an attachment. So people are like, oh, I didn't see it. So I didn't fill it out. But uh, the problem was, and the problem is, is that they were sending out letters like this, which said, hey, we're writing to you to state we have information that you have or had one or more accounts containing virtual currency, but may not have properly reported your transactions involving virtual currency. And this was just sent out by, what was this? August 14th, 2020. So if you happen to have written no, you may have seen this uh, form. And for everybody who's like, ah, they'll never find me, they'll never know. Well, guess what? If you want any kind of exchange, you fill out your social, gave your driver's license, personal information, guess who that went to? Your government. So don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you right now, I've been through an audit. It's the worst of all time. You don't want to go through it. It just sucks. Um, that's all I'll say about it. I didn't want to go through the whole process. But I'm going to, at the very end of this video, I'm going to link to the video where I talk about how I don't pay crypto taxes. I'm just not going to. And this is why. And I'm going to use what's called iTrust. And iTrust is a cryptocurrency IRA. That's what it is. And even if you have a traditional IRA, regular account uh, somewhere else, or an old employer plan like a 401k, a 403b, a military TSB, or a 457, and you want to move it over to cryptocurrency, you can do that tax and penalty free with iTrust. Here's all the different assets you can uh, put your money into, which will be tax free. Now, granted, it's when you take it out and all that stuff, but I go over that in detail in the video and I'll link at the very end. But the reason why I did a crypto IRA is because I have a feeling that uh, Bitcoin and the rest of my assets are going to go up massively. And I'd rather pay a little bit of taxes right now than pay a boatload of taxes when I have to actually, you know, have capital gains. And I'm not doing that. So that's what I'm doing. You can take a look. It's up to you. All right, finish this up. It says, contrary to one might think, according to data released by crypto analyst firm Sentiment, Bitcoin tends to see a big surge whenever online sentiment around is hovering in FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. I thought this was interesting. It said, prices of Bitcoin and other crypto assets tend to bounce more precipitously when the crowd is demonstrating a high level of FUD. This is exactly what we've been seeing with Bitcoin, Ethereum, and many altcoins. So... When there's FUD, it's good, I guess. So I think I wrote this little note. I said, well, maybe we should be thanking Peter Schiff when he you know, poo-poos all over Bitcoin. Maybe that's actually helping us, which is great. And then lastly, it says generally the best buy opportunities in crypto come when the average trader is down, both psychologically and financially. That's what our metrics currently indicate. So here's the thing. It's going to be uncertain. It's going to be a rocky road. And if, you, if you're a trader, I mean, God bless you. Good luck. I'm not, I just don't trade. Uh, I'm just an investor. I dollar cost average. I save some money uh, back. And then when I see these dips, I buy the dips and I don't feel that tightness in my chest knowing that I just dumped a bunch of money into it because I didn't dump all ton of money. I just dollar cost averaged in. There's one thing that I always try to remember and that is that you don't FOMO. You buy the dips as best as possible. And I remind myself that this isn't 2017 when it was just, you know, white papers and vaporware. This isn't just based on like theory. There's actually track that has been laid. There's institutional investors that are here. There's big name players that are talking about it. There is so many bright side up from what it used to be. It, it's just, it's like night and day. Uh, and if you're around 2017, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So I think 2021 is going to be a great year. I think we're all going to be, uh, happier <laughs> than 2020. It just got to take time. So I'm just going to stay the course and I think we're going to see uh, fantastic results. All right. And one thing that could derail that whole process is you do all the things you're supposed to do, but then you get hacked and you lose all your crypto. So uh, I'm going to go over a cue of the day right now, and this is important. So let's jump in the office. All right, everybody, welcome back to the office. And I got a pretty good question today, which is all about uh, loss and uh, hopefully what not to do. So this should be pretty good. So this was from uh, Garkon 2020 and Garkon states, 
Uh, he says, Rob, in today's show, you spoke of KuCoin's loss of a major amount of crypto. Yeah, $150 million. That's, a, that's a, quite a sum, I will tell you. He states, uh, he or she states, I am less than a year in and made an error in how I stored my coin and had three and a half Bitcoin stolen when someone was able to access my seed. So that sucks. Imagine going to bed and then waking up and you're like, wow, I just lost, you know, $30,000, $35,000 uh, just like that. That's a bummer. And uh, he states, in all transparency, I learned to never store the seed words in a file on my phone. When I upgraded and backed up my Apple to transfer all the data, it was within days of this action when my hard wallet had been completely raped of all my Bitcoin. I went to the police and they certainly can't help, but what do I need to do? Can it be reported? Am I just SOL? Can I even take it as a loss? I'd like to hear your thoughts. And uh, so here's my thoughts. Uh, first of all, it sucks. I'm really sorry that happened. Uh, there's nothing worse than you know getting screwed out of your money, uh, whether that be from, from your fault or from someone else's fault. Regardless, irregardless, uh, it still sucks. So first thing is, I'm glad you learned that uh, don't do that. So when, uh, when Garcon here is talking about uh, taking uh, uh, screenshots or putting them to his phone, what he probably did was when he wrote down those mnemonic phrases for his nano ledger or for you know whatever kind of wallet that he had, he probably stored it in his phone in some way, shape, or form, either as a note, either as a picture, or something like that. So don't do that. Anything connected to your phone can be hacked very simply, very easily by anybody who wants it. I try to keep everything offline as much as possible. That's why I used that Shield Folio book or Stone book. There's a link in the description. You can check it out. That's where I store all my seed phrases. And actually, uh, someone said they had a great idea. They have a backup of that book. They bought two of those books, and they said one is in my one is in my safe, and one is at home for easy access. And I was like, "It's a pretty good idea, actually. I should probably do that." So uh, don't store anything on your phone. That is a big thing. So the next question is like, "Well, am I SOL, uh, and can I at least claim it as a loss?" Well, first of all, uh, to answer the first question, yes, uh, you're SOL. Sorry, and that's the problem with decentralization, uh, cryptocurrency, digital assets is being your own bank means it really comes down to you. And there's the positives and there's the negatives. And this is one of those negatives about being your own bank. You gotta be careful and uh, that's just how it goes. On the other side though, the question is, well, can I claim it as a loss? And that is a great question. And because I'm not a CPA, nor do I play one on TV, I reach out to my friend, uh, Sheehan Ch Chandra Sakara. And you don't know Sheehan, he writes for a bunch of different publications, uh, Cointelegraph and all those different big ones. And uh, he's my, he's my go-to guy when I don't have the answers. And I sent him a message on Twitter. I said, hey man, uh, I got a question from a subscriber. I believe the answer is that he can take the losses because what I thought, but want a second penny. Here's the message. I told him what it was. He goes, yeah. He goes, I actually answered this in a post, so go read that, so, which is you know, good. He doesn't have to deal with me and my nonsense of you know, going through the whole thing. So the post that he wrote was on August 7th, 2020, so very recently. And he breaks it down. He says, hey, what's a theft loss? Well, according to the IRS, a theft is the taking and removal of money or property within the intent to deprive the owner of it. Since crypto are treated as property uh, for the IRS, a lack of crypto due to scams or an exchange hack meets the IRS theft loss criteria. So you're thinking, great, this is fantastic. But wait, there's more because it's never simple because it's the IRS, right? Uh, first of all, sending crypto to an incorrect address or misplacing your private keys by your private keys by mistake it is not theft. So if you screw up and you just lose your your private keys, it gets burned, it gets wet, it just goes away. You lose it. That's not theft. That's on you. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, that's that's just how it goes. So the amount of loss eligible for the deduction is the difference between the fair market value at the time of the loss versus the fair market value after the loss. For example, if you sent uh, half a Bitcoin to the Twitter Bitcoin scammer, at the time you sent it, it was worth 5,000. Your theft loss for tax purposes is $5,000. Now the deductibility, having a personal theft loss does not necessarily mean you can deduct it on your tax forms to get a tax benefit. Well, then that suck. So you're like, well, great. Well, at least I can you know, claim it as a loss, which is fantastic, but no. Uh, prior to January 1st, 2018, Personal theft losses were deductible on your tax forms. Uh, form 4684, Schedule A. No idea what that is, sure. As a result of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, TCJA, which I think was just passed recently, between January 1st, 2018 and December 31st, 2025, 
you can only deduct theft losses attributed to federally declared disaster areas. So if you're living in a disaster area, sure. Good chances though, might not have been. Unfortunately, crypto scams incurred on your uh, personal crypto accounts during this period are not deductible on your tax forms. Let me read that again. Unfortunately, crypto scams incurred on your personal crypto accounts during this period are not deductible, personal. So uh, if it's just you, you have no small business, uh, you're, you really are SOL, and that's the bummer. So losing the tax write-off may not be detrimental. The tax code only allows you to write off a portion of your theft loss as opposed to the full amount. To arrive at the deductible amount, $100 plus 10% of your adjusted gross income is subtracting from your full theft loss. For example, if Mary has $5,000 and she loses it, but her uh, uh, adjusted gross income is $100,000, uh, her deductible loss would be $3,900, which is $5,000 minus $100,000 uh, 100, minus 10%. Very boring stuff. If, if you're kind of like lost, don't worry. Just give it to your CPA and they'll figure it out. So really what it comes down to is this. Uh, personal losses, you're still SOL. Sorry. Uh, but if you have a business, uh, business theft losses are still deductible. So for example, if a crypto mining company, which runs as a trader business, loses coins to scammers, they will be able to deduct that loss on their business tax return. So Really, you'd have to say like why you are using cryptocurrency in your business, and then you can deduct it. Otherwise, you got to wait till you know between 2018 and 2025. You just you just uh, SOL. So that's why I'm always harping on these scams on this channel. That's why I'm always harping on you know ways to save your your pass raises. That's why I have a link for you for that Shield Folio or Stone Book where you can store it. Uh, I just ordered my second one, so I'm waiting for that because I got to back everything up. Anyhow, uh, I know it's a bummer of an answer, but it is the truthful answer, and uh, hopefully it answers everybody's question. All right, let's jump back. All right, so that's it. So I hope that answers some question. Hopefully you can take some information on that and learn from someone else's mistakes. You, can, you have to learn from mistakes. They just don't have to be yours. And I'm going to link uh, that final video about how I'm not going to pay any crypto taxes because I refuse to do it, and um, you decide for yourself. But uh, that's it. So thanks for sticking with me. I really appreciate it. Um, if you like the types of videos, it's gonna be two more gonna pop up, left and right. I'll put one of those over there and YouTube's gotta control the other one, so I don't deal with that. And uh, that is all. Also, I'll be on uh, Alex Maschioli's show in about 30 minutes, and we're gonna be talking to the CEO of BlockFi. So uh, hopefully I can answer some, ask, get him some good questions in, because I know a lot of people have been saying that I need to check it out. So I thought, hey, what a better time to check it out than <laughs> talking to the CEO. All right, so that's it. Thanks so much, and I'll see you on the next one.